Good evening, everyone. How are we doing? I hear there's a little weather out there, maybe more towards the south of us. My name is Cliff Lobby, and I'm the Public Affairs Director and Public Programs Manager here at the FDR Presidential Library, and I wanted to thank you all for coming out. I see a lot of familiar faces and a lot of new faces, too. Do we have any members in the audience tonight? Very good. And trustees, library trustees, I know we have Fritzi Goodman in front with her husband, Jack. Very good. Well, thank you all for coming out. Um, we're excited to be hosting this program, Presidential Transition with Mark McKinnon and Alexander Hefner. I was thinking a little bit, a bit before this program um, about President Obama's address on Tuesday night. Um, there was a small quote tucked in there that kind of stuck with me. If you're tired of arguing with strangers on the internet, try talking with one of them in real life. <laughs> And um, it hit home for me because I can be sort of an armchair quarterback and an armchair pundit over social media. And I think a lot of us can be. I do know that there's quite a few of you in this audience tonight that are the opposite and are very active. Um, I can say with certainty that the gentlemen on the stage tonight are the complete opposite. These are men who have ded are dedicated to getting out there and keeping us informed. Um, PBS host and journalist Alexander Hefner and American political strategist and former presidential advisor and producer of Showtime's The Circus, Mark McKinnon. <laughs> With that very quick introduction, I'm going to turn the floor over to Alexander Hefner. Take it away. It's, it's on now. Um, thank you all for being here. Mark, it's really a pleasure to meet you finally. I've long admired the cause of uh, celebrity in the political arena, uh, but also the cause of advocacy that um, generates consensus, compromise, and is conducive to the health of our democracy. And Mark has been a steward of that kind, that brand, that character of uh, political thinking, and uh, I hope you all, if you haven't yet, checked out his series on Showtime, which is the most intimate, uh, intense workout of the exercise that was American politics and continues to be from the primary campaign through the general election. Uh, so welcome, Mark. Thank you. Thank you. Honored uh, to be here. I have grew up here with Cliff and his predecessors, um, and it, it, it's really a formidable venue to be considering the future of American politics. Um, there was a story that some of you may have read in the paper, um, the Albany paper, um, which was a, a great history of this moment and parallels between uh, the men just in terms of their um, personality, um, uh, fervent commitment to a, an agenda, and of course, New York born and bred. Um, aristocrats and now populace um, who one tested through the political process, one untested. Um, but the, the idea of this conversation was to understand more fully the nature of where we've been and where we're headed. In the past, um, Mark has been involved at the heart of a presidential transition from campaign into the beginning of, of governance and certainly has advised politicians before President Bush. But I thought we would start there with as, as you're processing this last period of transition and anticipating the inauguration. Um, given, again, your observation of this primary and general election so close to the candidates and the advisors and the people who were making and shaking, um, what, what do we make of this particularly unprecedented moment? What do we make of this moment? Well, we're going we're to be making a lot, and we're going to be... Yeah, it's, my red light's on, so... One, two, check. I'll, I'll just try and get it up a little bit. <laughs> okay. Uh, this has, been, this has been the most surprising election in American history. Yeah, right? Anybody disagree with that? So we're going to be talking 
and examining, and historians will be looking at this election forever. There is so much that's happened in this election that is unprecedented. Um, we have taken the rule book, put it in the shredder. <laughs> and so there's a ton to talk about, and I'm, I'm honored to be here. Uh, Cliff was nice enough to just give us a quick run through the, the, uh, the, uh, the exhibit, which is spectacular. I was just telling him that my favorite monument in Washington is the FDR monument. If, if you've been to Washington, or if you haven't been, go. It's, it's the, all the monuments are fantastic, but by far, to me, the most moving and compelling and interesting and creative monument is the FDR monument. And the exhibit is, is I've seen a lot of presidential libraries, and this one is just the touch and the tone and the feel is so perfect to me. And because the, the libraries uh, are all different in their own way, but this one just feels authentic to me. It doesn't, I mean, some of them are kind of glitzy and fancy, and they're all interesting and compelling in their own way, but this to me just really struck a very authentic chord. And my favorite exhibit of all, of course, was to see his lucky hat that he wore four times in all of his elections, which is great because uh, I know I'm, I'm a big hat man. Um, the part of what has been dramatic about this election has been, as I sort of mentioned in the preview, is, is that it's, it was so surprising to everybody. And by the way, when I say everybody, I mean everybody, OK? I mean including Donald Trump. Um, I know from having been intimately in, around all the campaigns for the whole election that, you know, even a day or two before the election, Trump's core team at the Republican National Committee were, were making presentations. They were trying to, they were trying to do their best job as they're supposed to, to convince people like us that Trump could, could win. And in their most creative presentation that they could make a day before the election, they got to 240 electoral votes. They couldn't even make up a plan that got them to 270. So even in their sort of best scenarios, the day before the election, the best that they could do was to get to 240. The two smartest people that I know in politics, one who uh, worked with me in the Bush campaigns was a strategist said having, ex and he was our kind of our data specialist, he said having examined all the data and given all his extensive knowledge in presidential campaigns, he said he was predicting a Hillary Clinton win with 95% probability. The smartest guy I know that worked for Obama, same role with the Obama campaign, said 100%, not 99, not 98, 100% probability. Now this guy is, is uh, as I said, the smartest guy I've ever been around politics. He said 100%. So that just shows you how wrong the smartest people in politics were about this election. Um, which again, I think testifies to how unprecedented it, 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 it is as well. Now, um, let me back up just a little bit to talk about the the environment, which is to say, it's not unprecedented that somebody like Donald Trump has run for president. Ross Perot did it in the 90s. Um, businessman, outsider, very wealthy. Same general idea. What a lot of people forget, except I know you don't, is that Ross Perot was ahead in that election in 1992 for four months. He was beating Bill Clinton and George H.W. Bush. Ross Perot was winning. And but for the campaign really kind of going off the rails for a lot of reasons, arguably he could have been elected president in 1992. So that model was already in the firmament. And over the last 10 years or so, I've thought a lot about sort of the Democratic Party, the Republican Party, how people were are unhappy, increasingly unhappy with not only Congress, but just institutions in general. And there's a lot of interesting data about that. Lack of trust and even the Supreme Court has really diminished. But 
certainly with in the party. So uh, I, I looked at that, and over, as, over the last four or five years or so, as I really dug into that. I, dug, I was thinking about the possibility that somebody could emerge like Perot again. And what was interesting to me was I went back and looked at the Perot years, and I looked at all the, the data and the research at the time that, that made it fertile for that kind of a run. And when I looked at the similar data recently, it was much more compelling. In other words, it was much better for a Perot-type candidacy now than it was back then. I mean, it was obviously good enough then for him to run. But just in theory, when you looked at the things that made it, that fired up Perot's campaign in 90, 10 years later, it was like magnified times 10. So the theoretical notion that somebody could run, could step into this vacuum, and there were a lot of things have to happen, obviously. But uh, so the, the, the notion that an outsider should show up and run should not have been a surprise. And in the first, our first episode of 26 episodes of The Circus was titled The Outsiders. And it featured Donald Trump, Bernie Sanders, and Ted Cruz, because it was clear then that there was a huge appetite for an outsider candidacy. But what was a surprise to everybody was that it would be Donald Trump. I mean, he was an outsider, but the factors that made that possible for him were, first of all, he showed up. And in politics, 95% of the game is showing up. He had the moxie to, to run. Now, I think there's a psychological play here for him, which again, I, I say that he was one of the people surprised. I think that, again, I'm, now I'm being sort of bedside psychologist, which is to sort of get into his head and and here's my projection, which is that he is a, a guy who loved the spotlight, was in the spotlight a lot in his life, realized that politics was a bigger, hotter spotlight than anything. You get a lot more interest in news than just being a, a builder. And then he, there's, and we just, we're just finishing a documentary movie version of the show, and we got some interesting clips. Of, because I go back to like 1990, where he first starts talking about I didn't realize that he was that young when he started talking about politics and kind of hinting that he might someday run. Uh, so uh, he had dipped his, his toe in the water there. So, but my view is that he saw this as a, as a sort of fun, entertaining exercise. He'd go uh, say he was going to you know, get in the, uh, run for president. And he's threatened it before and got a bunch of attention. He did it this time. But then, surprising a lot of people, he actually ran. And uh, I also, we also know from some good reporting that he thought Chris Christie was going to win. And he had intended to endorse Chris Christie when he won. And then what happened was he just kept winning. And, and after a certain point, he said, well, this, this ain't that hard. And he knocked down a formidable Republican field. I mean, this was not a bunch of nobodies. This was Jeb Bush, Marco Rubio. I mean, you know, a lot of heavyweight players, and uh, which again testifies to that appetite that the country had for change. I'll, I'll stop and let you no, no, no. get into this conversation. Hey, but so one of the things that's unique about the documentary is that it gives you an insider's access um, to really be there on the convention floor, to be there on the Street Talk Express, or the contemporary rendition of that, which was John McCain's bus. Um, at a certain point, even though it's bewildering to us now, even three months into this transition, um, there was, when I was traveling the country, Dayton, Ohio, South Bend, Indiana, going from the Rust Belt to the city, and the urban decay that Donald Trump identified as a source of angst in the middle class, not just rural and, and suburban, Th that was real. And, and, uh, and so considering the enormity of the inequality issue today, uh, how do you suspect, beyond the flair and personality, uh, the Republicans are going to um, Assume some accountability now for the for the beast that they you know sort of 
are responsible for, and and you know you your whole career channeled those energies constructively around no labels, the organization that fosters compromise on the Hill, working with John McCain, Cory Booker, a host of folks who have been shown an appetite for compromise. Now there potentially is some movement so that this transition can be rather productive legislatively. You know, how do you think about that relative to when George W. Bush won the presidency and had um, a potential legislative path or trajectory to take? Uh, how do those moments compare? And obviously, very different climate today of dissatisfaction with politics. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's fascinating. The, in many ways, Donald Trump, and a big part of the reason he won is he is post-ideological. I mean, he was not a typical Republican. In fact, 10 years ago, he was a Democrat. That was part of his appeal for a lot of people. A lot of people in America feel the same way. They'd, and there is a results component to Donald Trump and his background as a builder to say he just gets stuff done. And a lot of people prior to this election that I dealt with and no labels in our work going out into the country, people, their sort of view is, you know, I don't care at this point if it's a Republican solution or a Democratic solution. I, we just want some problem solving. And so Donald Trump, as a guy who cut deals, negotiated, got stuff done, there was a real appeal to that. And so when you look at his, you know, the legislative potential, the wrong message uh, and the wrong message that I think the Democrats are, are potentially going down this road, Donald Trump didn't get elected because people loved the Republican agenda of the last Congress. They, they, I mean, the, the, sh the government shutdown and stuff, that was not productive. That was not helpful. That was, I mean, it was, it, it stopped a lot of legislative things from happening that the Republicans wanted to set up. But that's not something that was popular with the country. That the, that the Republicans were shutting government down. So my... my nor, nor is the candidate himself. Yeah. 20, 20%, yeah. 30%. Yeah, uh, right. And so... Um, but you've done a lot of work in this architecture that leads these two parties to nominate people who would not ordinarily be palatable. I mean, that's been the, <laughs> that's been the crux of your focus in the last decade. Well, the, the, the crux is to... Uh, a, 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 the work is to try and bring together and elect people who are willing to compromise and work with right. both sides. And no matter what you think of Donald Trump, he's, he's not going to be ideologically rigid. I mean, he's going to do whatever it takes to get a deal done. And let me just give you an example. Um, so uh, l let's say that you are a fan of or believe in the idea of an infrastructure program in the country, a huge rebuilding you know, rebuild our bridges and roads and what have you. If you think about this, it's, it, I, I could, I, I'll argue right now that Donald Trump's the only president that could make this happen. Here's why. If it were a Republican president, a normal Republican president, uh, they would never spend this kind of money. He's talking about a trillion dollars. And, you know, Steve Bannon says, you know, we're going to, Steve Bannon, his, his chief sort of architect strategist said, we're going to make Republicans choke on this bill, meaning the spending. And the Democrats will love it, I mean, because it's a big spending bill. Now, there's going to have to be the right union stuff and all, you know, it'll, it'll, it'll be a lot of back and forth. But, but if it were anybody else, first of all, if it were a Democratic president, they'd never get a single Republican vote on this for the spending. And if it were a Republican president, they never would have done it in the first place because they wouldn't spend that kind of money. So if, it, if, so, if you think about it, if you're for a big the infrastructure spending bill, Donald Trump may be the only guy that could get it done. Now, there's an enormous challenges, of course. He's going in with a favorable rating lower than any president, incoming president, by far. By far. And the notion that the incoming president would have a, a worse favorable rating by 20 points than the outgoing president, <laughs> that's unprecedented. So, you know, the, the person who has gone down in history as the greatest 100-day president is this guy. And uh, 
so going in with a 37% approval rating is, 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 is not a good way to go in in terms of getting stuff done. On the other hand, um, I, I'm encouraged so far that, that you know, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that he's working well with Paul Ryan and, and as I said, there's an infrastructure, I think, potential. I think they're going to get a tax reform thing done. I think, I think the whole uh, health care bill, despite all the rhetoric about it, will be something not com completely different than what's out there today. They'll change it in ways they can say we changed it, but they're not going to dump 30 million people on the streets. Uh, that would be political suicide. And, and I think on immigration, there's going to be some progress because uh, just on kind of border security stuff because Republicans want it and Democrats want to vote against it. So I think there's some potential there, but this, th again, this is uh, uh, a president whose approach and style is completely different than anybody we've ever known before. And uh, he surprised and shocked us during the election. I think he's going to surprise and shock us as president. Oh. As <laughs> president-elect, he's certainly done that. And we're, we are in those uncharted waters. What was unique ab about FDR's approach during those 100 days and during the campaign was appealing to the intelligence of, of the American electorate. And he, he was, uh, you know, in his fireside chats, not appealing to um, the, the basest uh, most exploitative means of um, tit for tat uh, in terms of the argument that is politics, and you know th there was this constant refrain that you would hear on the circus or MSNBC and other networks where you've appeared. And when is he going to turn presidential? The answer was not as the presidency that we've respected for many decades, if not centuries, and that. His moment, presumably to shine or to display that quality, is coming up next week. Um, uh, to some extent, right? I mean, w you couldn't judge that by the RNC acceptance speech. I went back and looked at that speech, Mark, and found one historical reference. The, the whole notion of I alone can fix this, well, that resonated in the speech because he wasn't rooted in our common ancestry as Americans. It, I mean, there was no explication of that. I went back and looked at, at Romney's speech at the RNC, referred to Kennedy, a Democrat, referred to, of course, the conservative Lyons, Reagan. You know, you, you are a strategist who relies on our fiber, our being, to contemplate how we move forward. And there's no sense of that history with him. Right, and you know, at every juncture, well not every juncture, but at, at significant junctures after the nomination, s since the election, there has been all this discussion and notion about, you know, are we gonna see some presidential temperament and bearing? And so far there's really no evidence of that at all. Um, I, don't, I don't, I don't, I, th I think that the one thing we can say with some predictability is that Trump's going to be Trump, and that that he's not going to change, and so he's going to he's for better or for worse. And like I said, he he may surprise us in 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 bad ways or good ways. I mean, just because nobody's ever governed in this style, we know it's going to be different and unpredictable. So let me just tell a story here about one of his his ability to command and control and manipulate the media, which obviously he did masterfully during this campaign. Um, <clears throat> he understands, I mean, he's an entertainer, comes from the entertainment world. And he has sort of created his own, his own media channel through, through Twitter. Right. And uh, remarkably, uh, it, it, the Secret Service is not going to take it away from him as president, it, it appears. So we're going to have a president tweeting uh, from the Oval Office. But let me just put a little bit of, just from, I'm a communications guy, and so uh, the story I want to tell is about Bill Clinton. And this was 1992, and a, a former colleague of mine, Paul Begala, 
who I went to school with, worked for President Clinton, helped to elect him, <clears throat> had a meeting with Clinton. And it was a debate preparation meeting. And so they were doing mock training. And they asked, Paul asked President Clinton a question about the balanced budget amendment, which was a big issue at that time. After 20 minutes or so into his answer, Paul said, Governor, you, you don't have 20 minutes, you have three. And Clinton said, oh, this is a very, this is a very complicated issue, Paul, very complicated. <laughs> and he started arguing with him, saying, well, you know, this is a, you know, it's, a, it's complicated, and I can't, you know, those, it's ridiculous to suggest that you could answer this in an intellectual way, you know, go, kind of going to the, you know, I have to do this intellectually and not dumb it down. <laughs> And, uh, and Paul said, well, then you'll lose. And Clinton argued back again, and then they kept went on. And so Clinton said, Paul, I challenge you. He said, show me an issue this complicated that can be articulated in three minutes. And Paul said, deal. And he pulled out a small pocket-sized Bible that he carried around in his pocket, for all I know he still does. And he opens it up to John 3.16 from the Bible. And he hands it to Clinton, and he says, here, Governor, read it. So Clinton reads it, and he says, For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not die, but have everlasting life. Paul is there with a stopwatch. Click. Now I'm going to tell you what Paul said verbatim. There, Governor, in 25 words lasting 6.8 seconds, St. John listed all the essentials of Christian theology. All of them. <laughs> Let me break it down for you. For God monotheism, not the gods, just God. It took humanity hundreds of thousands of years to come to the conclusion there's only one supreme being. John 3.16 covers all that ground in two words and a fraction of a second. So love the world. God is not only singular and supreme, but also benevolent. God is capable of affection on a global scale. He, okay? So God's a guy. If that offends you, take it up with the author. Gave his only begotten son. Okay, he's got a son, a begotten one at that, and God is willing to ship him to earth as a gift. That's an enormously complicated concept, fraught with ramifications, but delivered in just five words. So that whoever believes in him, having faith in the son as a prerequisite to what comes next, shall not die but have everlasting life. That's the payoff. Faith triumphs over everything, even death. No wonder believers call this the good news. And... So that's why uh, those of you who are as old as I am in this audience remember in big sports spectacles, particularly NFL football games, there'd be the guy with the rainbow afro holding up the sign that said John 316. Tim Tebow, who's a recently famous athlete, it was photographed after winning the college national championship. He went into the press conference, and in his eye black, it said John 316. Why? Because... Before the game, he said, I have a few thoughts in my mind. One, I think we're going to win this game. Two, when we are, I'm going to get a lot of attention. And three, when we do, i got something I want to say that has nothing to do with football. And I can get it across in 6.8 seconds. Now, the interesting thing about this is just recently, after this election, I thought about this, and I thought about Donald Trump, and I thought about Twitter, and I read, it's 140 characters, Guess how long 140 characters is? Seven seconds. So he understood that that, by the way, the attention span of human beings is eight seconds, the average attention span. Goldfish is nine. <laughs> it's a true fact. It's a true fact. Microsoft research. <laughs> but that's just, I mean, so that's something we're going to have to get used to because we're going to have a president. And by the way, Think about it. He's got, I, last time I looked at it, 14 or 15 million followers. Uh, 19 now? 20. Yeah, okay, maybe it's up yeah. to 20. That's a lot more than the Washington Post or the New York Times. And by the way, one of the, you know, one of the things that we're going to be thinking about and examining and studying for a long, long time is the media's role in this election and this whole idea of fake news and who do you trust anymore to get news information sources from. So... Donald Trump has, again, masterfully, whether you agree with it or not, turned the public and his followers against the press. They don't believe the press anymore. So if they don't believe the press, who do they believe? They believe him. That's still a minority of the country, though. Um, 
his followers. Right, well, the, right, the followers, or if you think about the popular vote, how do you ensure that the majority does not, um, you know, it, it has been said that it is, it is under the conditions of incoherence and, and uh, contradiction that an authoritarian can, can rise and assume power and manipulate people on a wholesale basis. So he just did it. <laughs> so, so he did it and, and now is, em, is emboldened to um, potentially court the majority um, or engage the majority. It, it, it doesn't, it doesn't. Well, that's, I mean, that's the great question, and that's the, the big question is, can he, can he translate that from campaigning to governing in an effective way? That is an effective way to win a campaign, but arguably, and I think what you're saying is that this is probably not an effective way to govern. Right. And so how do you, how do you expand from that minority that elected you to a, to a majority that governs? And that's, that's where we'll see whether or not there can be some growth or evolution. Because I think you're right. In order to in order to be successful president, you've got to rally the country behind you in, in the way that FDR did. But you know, I mean, FDR did it with fireside chats. That was kind of his Twitter, right? right that that right. was a new technology that's never been used before, and so he used that effectively. And and you know, I there there yeah. Again, I, I'm a hat, glass half full guy, and I'm always trying to think about how 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 can this turn out well, and I hope it does. And I think the most Americans, whether they like Trump or not, obviously hope that things go well for the country. And and one of those ways you could argue would be that <clears throat> that he's you know his his interest is not in like being the greatest Republican ever. He wants to be like the Jobs president, right? I mean, he wants to he wants to build a wall and create jobs. That's kind of what he ran on. And and I think that at the end of the day, he doesn't care if. You know what? Ultimately, what Republicans think about him, they're gonna—he's gonna think, "Did I create jobs? Did I make America great again?" And so uh, uh, that's why I think he'll potentially, whereas other Republican presidents might not have, be more open to negotiation, compromise, and working with Democrats. My question is—I mean, at some point, Republicans might abandon him. Right. right. We were talking about some of the courageous voices that emerged in the Republican camp. Ben Sass, in particular of Nebraska, who is, I would say, the lone, along with Evan McMullen, the, uh, but the lone voice in the U.S. Senate. Um, potentially, John McCain. I, my theory about John McCain has been he's, he's sort of been waiting to speak up, and to see something so egregious that he decides to reclaim his maverick mantle. And well, Russia's part of it, and he's already. Yeah, he's already starting to crack that up. And Marco Rubio this week too has, has been uh, pretty tough on on some of Trump's, uh, or at least on one of Trump's cabinet. For, for those of, of us who fear that the entertainer in chief uh, moniker is is really in practice what's going to play out, uh, are you aware that that this has been historically? Um, within Republican ideological circles of those who've been tapped, primarily conservatives, to serve in his cabinet, that this transition has um, been modeled on historical transitions where you know, there was a story about how the chief, um, the DC chief who manages security for the inauguration, apparently he is of the non-political officials being asked to resign. He's being asked to resign. You might have read this in the Washington Post. Uh, as the inauguration is taking place, there, there have been some instances where nominees have not been suited for their office necessarily or don't have a background in their office. Uh, generally, the confirmations have suggested that there is some order in you know, the processing of these um, candidates. But is there anything that suggests to you that um, the, this transition, in fact, is his, historically different than what you experienced in 2000, other than the fact that that was a late blooming transition, uh, too, in, in, in some ways, and because of the recount. Right. Um, well, one of the, you know, uh, one of the differences is that we have a much shorter window than FDR did. You know, he had until March. Right, 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 right. right. 
Um, and one of the one of the things that's happened in recent history, too, is that you don't have to wait till election day to start the process of getting people vetted by security folks right. to get clearance. So that's kind of a longer story. But um, I think in our case, it's, a, it's, it's different in the sense that with George W. Bush or with, I think, with any tr traditional, more traditional traditionally elected presidents, they thought about it a lot longer, and there's kind of a, a, a more uh, f formal, systematic, expected cast of people. Right. Because, right, it's, it, I mean, if Hillary Clinton were president today, her nominees, we'd all be going, oh, yeah, yeah, right, okay, yeah. I mean, there wouldn't be that many surprises, right? They'd be, you know, right. John Podesta, the Secretary of State, or, you know. But so we have a bunch of, it's been su it's been su surprising to me in a in a good way, really. So far, I mean, again, it's not some rigid ideological exercise where it's just like putting up the most conservative. I mean, obviously, some of them are very conservative, but then they're they'll throw in some that aren't and put Nikki Haley at the UN. And um, I think that I think it has it has been actually been less controversial than I would have thought so far. And I think most of, this, uh, most of those nominees will get through confirmation. Let me just give you one example. So um, I, I don't, I, I, you know, I try and keep an open mind about these sort of things. Uh, but so when he nominated Rex Tillerson, my first reaction was, what? You know, I thought, seriously? You know, the head of Exxon is our, is our Secretary of State? And no experience? You know, it seems like that's one position where you want a little bit of experience, right? But then the more I read about him and the more I heard about him, the more interesting the pick became to me. And when I hear people like James Baker and Condoleezza Rice say, you know, this guy is a fantastic pick, and there's a great story uh, about his service on a jury that a fellow juror wrote about just what kind of a human being he was during this jury process. You know, never said that he was the CEO of Exxon, never, never played any kind of advantage or I'm smarter than anybody, but of course they all elected him head of the jury. But he was, this, he was a very compassionate, interesting guy. And then, you know, you think about it, you think, well, actually he's been in a lot of very difficult, challenging parts of the world. I mean, the Exxon is obviously in all, every part of the globe um, and dealing with, at times, hostile foreign government. So maybe he has exactly the kind of skills we need. I don't know. You know, as I said, but, but I, you know, I just had a conventional reflex, which I think probably a lot of people did to that pick. But, you know, I've got an open mind about it, and maybe, you know, maybe he'll be a great Secretary of State. Well, I think that the analysis is um, shared about having that background, but with the fear that there is some element of espionage or element of Manchurian candidate uh, in, in the principle, in the, <laughs> in the, uh, that their incest, or to whatever ex extent it is, incest with Soviets, uh, former Soviet agents in Russia, is, could be problematic. But Can I talk about that for Yes, a please. Okay, so. And, and a media organization, too, we're going to talk about. Yeah, oh yeah. With yeah, innuendo. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, so the, the Russian overlay of this election is a, is a fascinating and I would argue deeply disturbing uh, element of this election. And um, I, I, again, and this may be one of those things we're studying forever, trying to figure out exactly what happened. Because early on in the election there was, I mean this kind of popped out fairly early, I don't know, I can't say exactly when, but this, the, the Russian overlay of it was out there for a while. So in our show, we thought that we would really get, investigate this deeply and do a whole episode focused on the Russian overlay of this election, and we were going to do it from Moscow and do the whole show from Moscow. And so we did a lot of planning, a lot of organizing, and interestingly now, especially as we look back, the Russian government never gave us visas. They wouldn't let us in. <clears throat> However, uh, just a 
couple of weeks before the election, my colleague, Mark Halperin, said, I'm still really interested in this whole Russian WikiLeaks overlay of the election. I think it's really important. I'm going to London, and I'm going to stalk Julian Assange, who's the founder of WikiLeaks, who is the, which is the conduit for our allegedly Russian leaks. And I said, <laughs> so you're going to do what? He said, yeah, I'm going to go stake out Julian Assange. And he did. And he went to London. And this episode is called From Russia with Love. And the whole episode is focused on WikiLeaks. And I have to tell you that I, you know, I worked on the whole campaign, and I thought I knew something about WikiLeaks. I didn't know anything until we really investigated this and got some of it into our show, but there was so much more. I mean, we could have, you know, we could do a whole two-hour documentary on it or longer or series on it. It, I mean, first of all, I'll tell you that, um, well, first of all, Mark got through to Julian Assange. He staked him out at the, at the embassy, and the way he did is he, he some mysterious character that, we, that he figured out worked with Assange, got him a note, Mark passed him the note, asked him a question, he sent back out the note, and it turned out it was Assange. And so he got, you know, he, he connected with Julian Assange. But as he said, as Mark laid it out, he said, this is really interesting. He said, so we have a Australian-born cyber terrorist working through a, an Icelandic organization under indictment from Sweden and the United States holed up in the Ecuadorian embassy in Britain, <laughs> imposing disrupting an American election. It's a hell of a story. It's a hell of a story. So we, we ran that, and, and anyway, as I was saying, I, I learned a lot, including that among the, we talked to the foremost experts on this, they said 100% probability that it was Russian involvement. There was no question about that. Absolutely Russian. So the notion that it was a 400 pound guy sitting in his basement, if that's true, he was Russian. <laughs> uh, uh, oh, and the w one footnote to that is that we discovered after we ran this show, just to tell you how WikiLeaks works, after we ran the show, we found out later that WikiLeaks had hacked Showtime and gotten the show before we aired it. I want to open it up to questions. I'm sure we have a lot of those. Can I tell my media yes, questions? Yes, please. Yeah. So, As it relates to BuzzFeed, which reported on an un unsubstantiated um, leaked uh, British intelligence report that you all are aware of because there hasn't been that substantiation with the definitiveness that you just expressed, which is why John McCain hasn't really... Well, this. this is, again, we could spend the whole yeah. hour talking yeah. about the media and its role and, right. and how those responsibilities have changed. And so you're talking... Alexander's talking about a story that just came out in the last day or two, yes, the last yeah. couple of days, uh, about allegations about Donald Trump uh, and activities uh, allegedly in Russia. Well, as it turned out, it has been shot down completely. Right. I mean, completely. Uh, it turns out it was a made-up thing, and the person who made it up has admitted it. But an organization just decided that they were going to just put it out there anyway. They, it was unsourced, and they just said, well, if we don't do it, then somebody else is going to do it. And that was kind of their rationale. It says, well, right. So we've got to this point where news is just like, you know, somebody says that you're an adulterer, we put it out there. You know, because if I don't say it, somebody else will. And that's kind of where, you know, the bar now of accountability for right. journalists is just gone. And so my own experience, I, just, I was telling Alex, I don't want to tell him this in the car. I'll try and keep this as tight as I can, but it's interesting. So we, when we started the show, we have big crews. Uh, like, it's like six people. It's big camera equipment, backup cameras, sound equipment. It's bigger than a normal, small, what we call ENG, electronic news gathering crew. And so when we showed up, per, it was early on, but others had been there longer, and we showed up from Showtime, and we're, you know, we're, we, you know, so we're the, so we show up, and these uh, rep reporters who've been around a long time, and are what we call embeds, are like embedded into the campaign, and we show up, and just because of, because we have a lot of history with a lot of these candidates, have worked for them or written books about them, we know them, and so we like got interviews at, and when all these other journalists had been there and had been there for months and hadn't been able to get interviews. So there was some, a little bit of ill will when we showed up, right? It's like, oh, you know, the big shots are here. And, 
And what happened shortly after that was we suddenly started encountering rumors that we were leaving hot mics around. And what they meant by hot mics was they were saying that we were secretly hiding microphones and recording conversations, not only the candidates, but between the candidate and reporters, and that we were secretly filming reporters over their shoulders of their, what's on their screens. So <clears throat> that was a problematic story for us because the campaigns are saying, well, what about these hot mics everybody's telling us about? And we're like, so this is, in, in the modern era, <clears throat> First of all, it would have been illegal. It's, a, it's illegal in a lot of states, but it was illegal in Iowa where the story started. Right? It's, it's illegal. You can't do that. You can't secretly tape a two-way conversation. It would have been unethical. It would have, if we'd done that and, and put it on the air, it would have been the last show we did. I mean, it would have been completely irresponsible. Nobody would have ever talked to us again. And plus, it's like I just said, if you watch the show, but the reporters that were asking this would say, well, who's saying this? They said, we can't tell you. So, so we're like, well, uh, it's no, false, no way, and those five things. And it would not die. I mean, week after week after week after week, and then somebody finally tweeted it, irresponsible. They just said, oh, rumor has it. But, you know, so then we have to like go knock that down. So here's the resolution of a long story, I'm sorry but just to tell you how media works today. So all this happens over a period of a couple of months and we still can't put this, we still can't kill it. We've said no a hundred times, I don't know another way to say no. And finally, a reporter prints it, prints the whole story and we once again say the same thing we've been saying for months and months and months. No, false, illegal, unethical, da 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 da. You know, it's, just, it's, it's, it's absurd and nonsensical. And so then a reporter wrote the story and so the next day, I go to a Ted Cruz rally, and a reporter walks up to me and starts asking me about it again. And I'm so frustrated at this point. You know, I'm doing all I can not to, like, come off my leash. And I was just like, well, we've said it a hundred times, and da, 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 da. And by the way, it was just printed, you know, full story about this. We knocked down every allegation. And I said, who are you with? And she says, oh, I'm with so-and-so, which was the same publication that reported it the day before. I said, now, wait a minute. You just printed this story yesterday. Why, and we gave you our answer. Why are you asking about it today? And, she, and the reporter says, well, people are still talking about it. Yeah. How do you deal with that? You know, I mean, just the perpetuation of fake news. So now that's just a little minor thing that happened with us, but that's the kind of thing that's happening right. all over with the news. Cliff, qu questions? So um, my question is, uh, and especially of what you were just saying um, about the press and, and repeating false stories, how long do you think before the, the Trump administration is going to fall into its own teapot dome scandal and will we believe it when it happens? Well, <laughs> yeah, we'll believe it when it happens, yeah. Um, I mean, one of the things that is, again, unprecedented is the extent to which he has business dealings, business conflicts, and then says, you know, uh, it doesn't matter with me because I'm president, I won. Uh, I mean, you know, you have deals around, the, I mean, it, it's, it's, it just boggles my mind to even think about it for 30 seconds, much less, much longer than that but the potential conflicts, even if they're accidental, you know, even if you weren't like scheming them, given the entanglements of business and, and, and then having the, the kind of people around him in the White House that he does with, with overlaid business interests, boy, I, you know, I, I can just tell you with my sort of brief experience with government, even the people with no business interests fall into some pretty deep traps pretty quickly and when it gets this complicated, I don't know how you avoid it. And he's almost an isolationist in clothes only, right? They think about Rhino, right? But it, he, his, whole, his whole actual business model of, of selling his brand has been internationalism and has employed arguably as many folks outside of the country as, as here. And he talks about, so I, I guess the, the question is so timely because it, 
you know, what's, what's going to wake up the American public? It, it, what kind of indication of that conflict would, would, be, would, would doom him? Would, well, you know, I mean, the question is, I mean, with America more broadly, but, but also what would, it, what, would, what would doom him with his supporters? You know, and because, we, again, you know, through the whole campaign, it didn't seem to matter that he changed positions or, I mean, all the traditional things you'd expect would, would doom any other candidacy. It didn't, see, it was, didn't matter to him. Right. And uh, because I think for his followers, there's a great line. My favorite line of the whole campaign was that it was from a reporter from Pittsburgh named Selena Zito, who, unlike a lot of other reporters, was actually in the, in the hinterlands, you know, in the blue collar areas of the country, seeing this phenomenon. And she said the mistake that the media, she said the difference is that the media took Donald Trump literally but not seriously and his supporters took him seriously but not literally. So I think that unlike other presidents, I think his supporters are actually going to give him a lot of latitude. I don't think they like took him literally. Right. They just wanted to go up there and kick, you know, break some china, do some shit different. Right. Excuse me. Uh, <laughs> But, uh, but I, I think he'll have some latitude, but, 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 but again, given the, all the conflicts and sort of thing that you, you suggest, I mean, you know, this, this notion of drain the swamp, I mean, he's already, like, he's already said, like, oh, I'm not going to say that anymore because now I'm president and, you know, it's like it's already, and it, like his, his campaign manager's already gone out and hung up a shingle as a lobbyist. Right. How do you square that? So at a certain point, that's got to accumulate and cause some problems. Yeah. Good evening. Uh, thank you for being here. Thank you for sharing. Uh, if you could touch on two words, collusion and uh, nepotism. Well, uh, nepotism is, uh, uh, and that's, they're going through that right now with, with, with his son-in-law, Jared Kushner. Um, I don't know. I, I'm, not, I'm not as, I guess I'm not as disturbed about that particular instance. I mean, to me it seems if you have, you know, family who are advisors and you want them to continue advising, it seems like there ought to be a way to make that work or happen. But again, I think it's, the, it's all the business stuff that just compounds the business conflicts. That's where it's problematic. I'm not so worried that you hire a son-in-law, but it just like amplifies and extends this net of interrelationships and business conflicts. And by the way, these people, I don't think, I th I, I, oh, listen, I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt to say they're well-intended, but I don't think they have any notion of how difficult it is to run a government and to do it cleanly. I mean, the cleanest of the clean, I mean, God bless Barack Obama. He got through eight years without a real, I mean, a, a, with a, a real ethical scandal. <laughs> Pretty amazing. That's hard to do. It's hard to do. Uh, so, um, yeah, it, it's, uh, the, you asked about nepotism and what was the other? Collusion. Collusion, yeah. Well, that's, I, I, the, another, I, I, just another concern that I have is that, and this gets very technical, but Donald Trump has elevated a bunch of senior people to, I, I don't even have the semantics right myself, but it's like the deputy assistants to the president, like Kellyanne Conway and, and Steve Bannon. And so, in other words, you, you have a fixed budget for, your, for the office, of the, for the West Wing. It's, 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 it's kind of like an NFL cap, right? You got a certain salary. But Presidents before Trump have had like, you know, two or three of these senior advisors. You, know, you kind of go down to the next level and there's 15 and the next level there's 100. But he put all these people like up at the top, like twice or three times as many as former presidents. And the problem with that, in my view and others who've worked in the White House, is that he's just put a bunch of cooks in the kitchen, like senior advisors without any like real authority to like run the government. They're just all like big thinkers. And like anybody who's been a strategist, apologist, but politics likes to think they're a big thinker, right? I just want to go advise and give big <laughs> thoughts. Well, he's got like a bunch of people in the White House giving big thoughts. 
and he's never run a government. They've never run a government. You got a bunch of th people thinking big thoughts. It's like who's going to actually run the government? That's that's a concern. Right. I think about Roosevelt's bold and persistent experimentation, and now you think about an untested experimentation that is haphazard, at best, and malevolent at worst. It's it's a difficult position. Over here. So, sort of to follow up on your statement, which is given the number of cabinet nominees who have expressed opinions that are different than those of the president-elect, who is going to be in charge? Well, I'm really encouraged by that. <laughs> I mean, I like the notion that, A, he's appointed people with different positions, and I think it's healthy to have debate within the administration. So I think the fact that he's not being uh, rigid about that uh, creates a climate of just discussion and debate within the White House. Which I, so that sort of that's some evidence that it's not completely authoritarian. Uh, which is not to say that he would ag agree with any dissent in the White House, but at least there there'll be some discussion or people there with some different thoughts. So I'm I'm actually I like that. I, I think that's good. What cabinet position did uh, the President Bush most agonize over in, in the 2000, 2001? Oh, gosh. Uh, i got to think about it all now. I don't know. I have to think about it. Okay. Uh, and woman over here. I will tell you, I just, I told this question, or uh, I mentioned this earlier. This is just kind of an interesting anecdote not many people have heard about. A year into Bush's administration, um, he called several of us over to the White House and just to kind of strategize politically about the future and the re-election and talk about who we saw as the greatest threat to his re-election. At the time, it was a completely, we were completely unanimous that it would be, here's your surprise, John Edwards. But at the time, if you recall, before all the problems, he was seen as like the young Bobby Kennedy, had this message about two Americas. He was really attractive, right? And the reason I bring that up is that the parallel to that for this time with my Democratic friends that I know well is the guy that they feared, like we feared Edwards, was Marco Rubio, right? Young, charismatic, with a millennial message. Um, so, but it's always an opposite. Uh, we talked about this earlier. The, the, when you think about presidents that get elected, in a, particularly in a change environment like this, they're almost always the complete opposite. Trump is completely different than Obama. Obama was completely opposite of Bush. Bush was completely opposite of Clinton. And you go back over time, and you see people don't, if they're, if they're making a change, they're not going to elect somebody like their own. So as attractive as Marco Rubio seemed to be, think about his problem. He's a lot like Barack Obama. He was a young, changed, charismatic, and people had just seen that, right? So what happened in the Republican primary said, uh-uh, not that. We want, <laughs> we want this guy. It was much different than anything that we've seen before. Hi. I'm wondering what effect um, these marches and we as a populace, what kind of checks and balances, like all these marches that are going to happen, what effect um, when we communicate our dissatisfactions, what effect does that have? <clears throat> Interested in your perspective as well, Alexander. Uh, you know, I think it's I think it's healthy. I think it's good. I think it's uh, I, I I think it's uh, it's a it's a it's a way to let democracy breathe. And you know, people. This was a, a shock and a surprise to a lot of people, and it's going to take. You know, I don't know. If I think a lot of people will never get used to it, and they you know. That's one thing we'll be watching closely on Bill of Rights issues with this president to make sure that he doesn't kind of shut that down. I mean, and there's always some bad signs about how they treat the media and like shut down media they don't like. Those, you know, First Amendment issues are, are uh, uh, you know, and we had a lot of issues about protests during the campaign, but, um, you know, if he's smart, he, he will, he will, he won't try and shut that down. And, and I think if the you know, progressives are smart, they'll keep it active. I want to ask you, how, how influential would you say uh, Vice President Cheney was to George Bush? And in compare, especially with foreign policy, 
what kind of influence he really had, and how would you compare that with the relationship that Vice President Biden had with Obama? And, I, and it was interesting that Bi Biden was recently just interviewed and said that really the, um, the only time that uh, the, um, the ethical issue will come up with Trump, he'll get an exemption unless 80% of the American people make it, make it so. Because if, if it stays at a 50% level, nothing's going to happen and, and Trump is going to get a pass. And also, and one other thing I wanted to ask was that you're saying that there's a lot of uh, different views coming out in, the, in, the, in Trump's cabinet, but he's, had, he's made no appointments with any Democratic influence. And I wanted to ask what you thought about that. Um, I think he just appointed a Democrat to the, uh, some cabinet level position. I can't remember what it is. Is this right? Somebody got me here? BA? The doctor. Yeah. Yeah, BA. Uh, well, let's talk about, uh, well, first of all, let me talk about Biden. I mean, I thought that was such a sweet moment yesterday with the Medal of Honor. I don't know if you saw that, but wow. That, you know, one thing I, uh, it's, it, uh, it's, uh, I commend uh, President Obama. I mean, one of the things that Obama was very uh, grateful and appreciative for George W. Bush was how, they, how he handled the transition. It was very diplomatic and gracious, and I, I think that President Obama has shown all the signs of doing the same thing. The what ifs of this election are really interesting. What if Bernie Sanders had gotten the nomination? What if? What if she was on the ticket? What if he was just on the ticket and those, and those ticket. millennials who were oh. not protesting in the streets came out? Because well, it could have been a different dynamic. Sure, absolutely. Or what if Joe Biden had run? Right. I mean, we, we did, I mean, again, we think about <laughs> reflection, what we did on the show. We devoted a, a whole uh, uh, episode to Joe Biden. And this is the one time where we really kind of had a fight with Showtime about it. It's like, really, you can devote a whole episode to Joe Biden? And, and, and we're really glad we did because it's a beautiful, uh, episode that really tells his story beautifully, I think, um, and and particularly now, given the outcome of the election, I think there's a lot of rearview mirror thinking about, you know, what if Joe Biden had run? But he's an interesting public figure. I think he was an excellent vice president. To your question about George W. Bush, there's a lot of mythology about the Cheney Bush relationship. Um, I, I'm not going to. Uh, let me. I'll just say that. George Bush was very much his, his own man, his own president, and nobody told him what to do, including Dick Cheney, which is not to say that Dick Cheney didn't have as, you know, more power probably than any, maybe any vice president. Uh, and that was a lot given his, you know, long history in government. But, but the notion that George Bush was a puppet of Dick Cheney is just, that's a, that's a, a you know, just a, 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 mythology, a mythological view of what actually how it, how it went down. Hi. Uh, there have been a number of questions uh, and a number of comments about what I think is essentially issues of leadership and the question about the role of uh, cabinet people, what kind of influence they'll have, how much they can or cannot uh, differ from, uh, from Trump. The, for me, the the central issue is one of personality and leadership. Um, I think of Trump as essentially inaugurating an ADD presidency where it's um, <coughs> leadership or governing by peak and by impulse rather than by any thoughtful and long-term uh, sense of where he wants to go. And so what appears to me, and I'm curious about other presidents, especially Bush, who you know, um, presidents don't necessarily think about everything that needs to get done. And so those people who are running um, cabinet, uh, uh, running departments, who cover things that the president is not that interested in or hasn't really thought about or doesn't have any kind of large strategic uh, perspective on, those people, I assume, are going to fly into the radar and 
are going to be able to do pretty much what they want to do. Uh, the people who, uh, who are independent along lines that cross paths with either a thought that Trump has had, a fleeting thought, or an impulse that he has, uh, those are the ones I'm sort of curious about what the outcome of those interactions is going to be about. Anyway, so the, everybody can only speculate about the future, but I'm curious about your um, information about Bush and that presidency in terms of a, the areas that Bush was not that interested in and who ran the show in those areas and what would happen when people disagreed with him in areas that he did have a point of view about. Great, good question. Uh, thanks. Um, uh, I, just to get to the root of it, uh, I'd say that the thing that, in my experience, having just been in the orbit of the presidency, that I think demands a great premium and gives me the greatest concern about President Trump is that it requires uh, unimaginable discipline. It, it, it demands unimaginable patience and caution. I mean, to me, those are, and what you're suggesting, I mean, the personality traits that we've seen from candidate Trump don't reflect that. <laughs> they reflect a very impulsive, reactive characteristic. That scares me. That concerns me. Um, I mean, George Bush, was, was very disciplined, um, and he put people in cabinet officials. I mean, he had, he, I mean, the, the, George Bush had a, whether you agreed with him or not, he, he sort of knew what he believed. You know, he was not indecisive. He, he, had, you know, he said, here's what I believe, here's what I want. And his management style was to say, I don't care how you get it done, but this is the outcome I want. This is the, these are the values I want to reflect. These are my big beliefs. We don't deviate from that, but and so some clear guide rails, um, and he was happy to have people disagree. And but I think that's that's what we really have to say. I mean, first of all, the, that reactive instinct is, you know, I mean, to take on Meryl Streep, I mean, to punch down at an actress from the presidency, I mean, to have a president doing that, that's. You know, and that's just, and he's not even president yet. And so, I mean, it's, if you're worried about what somebody's saying at the, you know, Golden Globes and responding to that when you're president, that's a, that's a concern uh, to me. Uh, you'd be punching down and wasting your time when you've got a lot of bigger, bigger fish to fry. Every president struggles with their relationship with the bureaucracy. Um, the federal civil service and in many ways government doesn't really run except due to the work of the federal civil service there's already great evidence that there's going to be hostility between this president and civil servants and I wonder if you could speak a little bit about what you think the relationship may be going forward and what that portends that's an excellent question um, and in, I can't, Alexander, maybe you can help me out here, but I know there's been some stories already about just civil servants fleeing D.C. Um, I, think that's, I think that's quite realistic and, and, again, another cause for concern when you have a president. Let me back up. The, <laughs> I think... If, if it were President Clinton we were talking about, President Hillary Clinton, and again, I'm not passing value judgments here. I'm just trying to be a neutral observer and analyst. But, you know, she would know uh, intimately who her deputy secretary was in the Department of Agriculture and probably known him for 30 years, know how they work, knows every department, knows how it works, she would be able to make the trains run on time, and there would be probably lines around the block of civil servants wanting to sign up. Um, we have just the opposite phenomenon now happening, which is you have a lot of civil servants 
who are worried about the current administration and are leaving. And so when you stack on or beneath a president who has no experience in government, with a lot of cabinet officials with no experience in government, with a civil service layer underneath that has been depopulated because of their concern about what's happening, that's a bad recipe. So that's another, that's an excellent question, and that's kind of one of those things that probably won't get a lot of attention now, but could really be problematic. Let's do two more questions. Hi. Um, one of my favorite episodes of the circus was when you were interviewing some of your old Bush colleagues about debate prep. And one of the, I think, one of the concerning things for me for Trump was that he didn't prepare at all. And I guess for some people, there's some kind of appeal for that. But you know, along the lines of the lack of experience, it's also just I think there's a question of does he even have the intellectual curiosity? You know, um, you know, even to lead the uh, the ghostwriter of his book, you know, the art of the deal, wondered if he's even read a full book in his adult <laughs> life. So I'm just wondering if you think if you can speak to that, just knowing a president, you know, working with George W. Bush to speak to. Well, thanks. That's a great, great question. Um, I'm glad you asked it. So let me talk about it in relation to President Bush and then in relation to Trump. So again, people had this sort of, you know, this happens in politics and modern media. You just kind of get a very one-dimensional, cartoonish caricature of candidates and presidents. It just gets lowered down to, you know, what can you make a cartoon out of this person that's just like a one-shot takeaway? And it says George Bush is dumb. Well, he's not. Uh, and, and he's one of the most street smart people you'll ever meet. Incredibly intuitive sense. And contrary to the conventional wisdom, worked his ass off and really prepared. Uh, I mean, you better know what you were talking about when you went into a briefing with him. And again, to his, to his credit, uh, he felt that the debates were important, that um, that that was, you know, one of the, the most important things that would happen during the campaign. And as a consequence, and he, but he didn't like it. He didn't like debate preparation. It's a miserable exercise. It really is. I mean, it's just hours of being drilled with a bunch of questions, with a bunch of super smart people who are trying to trip you up. You know, it's, it's like sitting around taking, you know, the MCATs or the SATs in an oral situation with a bunch of people who are like the best in the business at it. Um, and so, like I said, it's just not a fun exercise ever. But he's knowing how important those debates would be and should be. We started doing debate prep with him easily six months before the first debate and, and did it every week. And we'd have mock debates and debate preparation and, you know, briefings. So, I mean, it was a disciplined exercise. And as it turned out, consequential in the election. Uh, and I, I, would, I would argue that as a result of that, he won the presidency, uh, having beat the conventional wisdom and when he debated Al Gore. But, but this is, again, this, the, one of the things I'm still trying to figure out myself is I have a presentation that I've done for years, which is, which is kind of like the seven habits of highly effective politicians. And it's sort of these rules. I, uh, my, my, my colleague that I mentioned before, Paul Bagal, and I, like, he'd worked for Bush. I mean, he'd worked for Clinton. I'd worked for Bush. And we got together and we said, let's look at all the campaigns we've ever done and figure out what are the things that all cam winning campaigns do or all losing campaigns do. And we came up with this kind of model of, of these kind of core things that you execute and, and, and the conventional, conventional wisdoms. And one of those conventional wisdoms is that was, now it was. I started to do this presentation recently. I like it to tore it up in the middle of it because I got to redo this whole thing now because of Donald Trump. But one of them was the importance of debates and being prepared. <laughs> not only was Donald Trump not prepared, remember he criticized Hillary Clinton for like taking a day off the campaign to prepare. <laughs> and, I rec and I loved her comeback on that, if you recall. I said, yes, Donald, I prepared for the debate just like I prepared to be president, uh, which I thought was a great comeback. But as we all now know, it didn't really matter, right? I, I mean, I, 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 I have to go back and revisit all three debates and think about it. But you know, you netted it out. I think you'd say Hillary Clinton won the debates, right? 
I mean, he may have won the second one, or I can't remember now, but, you know, and, and by the way, that he was not, not prepared, and people didn't seem to care. So that's one of those things I'm trying to figure out. Last question. Hi. Uh, this is one thing that was not brought up during the presentation this evening, uh, but that's going to be President Trump's relationship with the military. Uh, throughout the campaign process, he made a number of statements which could be considered somewhat controversial or uh, derisive about the military, claiming that he knows more about ISIS than the generals, um, comparing his success as a businessman to the sacrifice of Captain Humayun Khan, who was killed in Iraq. How will these comments affect his ongoing relationship with our armed forces, and how might he intend to use them throughout his presidency? Really good last question. Um, I think that's I think that's critically important. The relationship the president has with the military, and and uh, what con concerns me, obviously, the things that you mentioned that he said during the campaign would would give you some pause, certainly if you were in the, if you were in the, if I was in the military, give me some pause. So who knows what, 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 I don't even know the nature of the relationship now. I don't know what, you know, sort of the zeitgeist of the military is regarding Trump, really, um, particularly given what he said during the campaign. But the more recent evidence of a parallel of what you're saying is his questioning the intelligence community just in the last few weeks. I mean, he's saying he doesn't trust the FBI or the CIA. Well, geez, if you've got an incoming president that doesn't trust the intelligence communities, and that's how you're starting off the presidency, is like taking on the FBI and the CIA, your own intelligence agencies, and endorsing Russians? There's something, you know, so uh, that, that, is a, that is a really particularly concerning uh, framework uh, that could destabilize fast, right? Because it's already problematic. I'll just make one additional comment before we close. The manifestation of that will be some sort of catastrophe. And we've talked about cabinet officials and their ill preparedness or the executive himself. But the failure or refusal to so, so called or quote unquote politicize tragedies, well, when you can't govern in a manner that is consistent with constitutional values or norms of, of sort of humanity, right, then the, the proof will be in that pudding that is the American experience for the next four years. And any, any last thoughts you have about how the Democrats can overcome what is this amusing ourselves to death um, of, of Neil Postman, thank you for a, a counter offensive that works more effectively than whatever Hillary Clinton did? Well, I'll just repeat what I said in the very last scene of the circus, um, which is, first of all, our founding fathers did a great job. They designed a system to keep the crazy out. So we have- Maybe the governor, out of the governor's mansion. <laughs> we have a lot of checks and balances that keep things from going completely off the guardrails. And to my friends and colleagues who are disappointed in the outcome of this election, I say, I realize that your greatest dreams are not being achieved, but neither do I think your greatest hopes be realized either. Well, can we please thank Mark for joining us. Uh, just as a reminder, for those of you who For those of you who don't have Showtime, you can watch the documentary in all episodes of The Circus on Amazon or any app on Roku, uh, or if you have a smart TV, you can do it there, and you can catch my show, The Open Mind, on PBS stations on Saturdays and Sundays. The, uh, Thank you. you also can get, there's a bunch of The Circus material that's just on YouTube. If you go to YouTube and The Circus, there's a bunch of scenes and some free episodes, and the documentary will be up there on February 3rd. I have a commercial, too. If anybody wants to become a member, you can do so out at the membership table on your way out. Thank you. Thanks Thank you. Coming.